On the 23rd of December, 1662, Juan Metzger wrote a letter from Batavia. Quote, We hoped that the other four missing vessels would have been found at St. Helena, but the contrary has been the case. And this has caused us great anxiety, and almost made us believe that some disaster from storms had befallen them. For shortly afterwards, God help us, we received news from Ceylon that the Arnhem had, in the said storm, been disabled by the loss of her rudder pin. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Fractured Crew of the Arnhem? Here we are. Enjoy! There were six ships in the return fleet of the Dutch East India Company for the year 1662. The ships gathered in Batavia towards the end of the year in 1661 to be filled with goods for the European market before returning to the Netherlands. For the time, the ships were very large. The flagship of the fleet was the Wappen van Holland at 920 tons. But even though it carried Admiral van Udschorn on board, it was actually the smallest ship in the fleet. Three of the other ships in the fleet were 1,200 tons, making them some of the largest ships that the Dutch East India Company owned. And another ship was 1,100 tons. The second smallest ship in the fleet was the 1,000 ton Arnhem, built in 1654 in Amsterdam. Each of the ships was loaded with items that the Dutch East India Company expected to get them the most profit in Europe. Spices, textiles, Diamonds and dyes were all piled into the holds of the ships as they departed Batavia on the 23rd of December, 1661. The fleet stuck together as it traveled, but it was slowed in its passage through the Sunda Strait due to the winds being against them, and they would not reach the Indian Ocean until the 5th of January, 1662. Here they had better luck, and the fleet was able to travel with more speed, but the favorable change in the weather was not to last. In the afternoon of the 9th of February, strong winds scattered the fleet, and for the first time since leaving Batavia, the Arnhem was now sailing alone. On the evening of the 9th, the violent rocking of the ship caused two barrels of tar that it was said were not properly stowed on the deck of the ship to break free and smash. The mess that resulted and covered the deck of the ship made for a miserable night of scrubbing for the crew. The strong winds that had separated the fleet turned out to be a sign of a terrible storm that was brewing. By the next morning, the wind was so strong that the captain of the Arnhem, Captain Van Oosterwout, ordered that all sail be taken in with the exception of the jib sail. For a full day, the Arnhem sailed under the power of just the jib sail. But this was not to last. The single sail was not strong enough to withstand the force of the winds that were now buffeting the ship, and on the morning of the 11th, the sail shredded. Without a sail, they were no longer able to make the ship run before the wind, and instead, it turned port side to the wind, taking the storm on broadside, while the men on the ship desperately tried to replace the sail. Due to the rough seas and the unstable rocking of the ship, Replacing the sail was no easy task, and due to the storm striking the port side of the ship, the ship now began to list to the starboard. They would soon learn that the barrels of tar were not the only things that had not been properly stored. With the ship listing to starboard already, the cargo in the hold now shifted to the starboard side of the ship, making the list of the ship even worse. Soon, the rough seas of the storm were crashing over the ship, and water began to pour into the Arnhem's hold. Attempts were made to pump out the ship by the now deeply concerned crew, but with the ship's dramatic list, the pumps were not able to reach the water. The crew began the task of bailing the ship by hand, but it was not very effective against the rush of the water that was coming in. Captain Van Oosterwout gave the order for the rudder to be secured to one side 
in the hopes that this would force his ship to turn and become manageable again. But though the rudder was secured, the ship continued to wallow, with its starboard side getting closer and closer to the water. On the morning of the 12th, with the storm only becoming stronger, Captain Van Oosterwout gave the order for the rudder to be secured in the other direction, hoping that the problem had just been to which side they had the rudder facing. As soon as the rudder was freed from its constraints, the men who were trying to secure it to the other side lost control of it. It repeatedly hit the stern of the ship until the rudder pin snapped. The desperate crew set to work to try and make a new rudder pin. The problem was that the room that the rudder pin ran through was a room used to store food, including a large amount of rice. Somehow, in the process of trying to put in a new rudder pin, a task which did not meet with much success, the cargo of rice broke free, and this too shifted to the starboard side of the ship. With this new disaster, the focus of the men shifted to trying to throw as much of the things weighing down the ship overboard. Beans and rice that had spilled were gathered in baskets and thrown overboard by some of the men while other members of the crew occupied themselves with pushing the ship's deck cannons overboard. For a moment, all work on the Arnhem came to a stop. About half a mile away from them, another ship came into view. The men on the Arnhem recognized her as another member of the fleet that had left Batavia with them, the Gekrunde Lu. Thinking that they were saved, the men on the Arnhem began to fire one of the cannons that they still had and hoisted a white flag, hoping to attract the attention of the Gekrunde Lu. It can never be known if their efforts were noticed by the Gekrunde Lu, but the other ship did not turn to help them. It is likely that by the time they saw the Gekrunde Lu, the people on board were not able to help themselves, let alone rescue the people on the Arnhem. The Gekrunde Lu would soon sail out of sight and never be seen again. No one knows when or where exactly she sank, but there would be no survivors out of the estimated 180 people she had on board. The disappointed men on the Arnhem had to turn their attention back to trying to preserve their own lives. By now, the rudder, which was still swinging out of control, had beaten a hole in the stern of the ship, and the sea was coming even more heavily over the sides of the ship. The crew did what they could to fill holes with canvas, but it was very little use. Some of the men on deck would be injured when the sea chests of sailors, which had been stored on the deck, also came free and began to crash around the deck as the ship was tossed by the storm. Captain Van Osterhout, who knew that there was a good chance that the Arnhem was going to sink, ordered the ship's barge to be launched to prepare for an evacuation. As soon as it was launched, about ten men scrambled into it and rowed away from the ship. They thought that if they brought it back alongside of the ship, the small barge would become overcrowded and sink, and therefore ignored all calls to come back. With the barge departing the ship, only the ship's boat remained. Faced with a quickly worsening state of affairs, Captain Van Osterhout ordered the ship's mast to be chopped down to lighten the ship. Unfortunately, when the mainmast fell, rather than going over the side of the ship, it instead landed on the deck, punching yet another hole into the ship on the starboard side, and allowing the ship to sink even faster. With this, the order was given to launch the remaining boat, and people began to put supplies into it and climb in to ensure that they would not be left behind. Other men simply fell into despair, and it was reported that by the time the boat departed from the ship, many of the sailors had become so inebriated that they were completely useless, having decided that this was not a situation they could face sober. Amazingly, 108 people crammed into the ship's boat as it was launched. There were 160 people on board the Arnhem, so not everyone would escape the sinking vessel, but... When including the ten people who had gotten into the ship's barge, the ship's two boats had an incredible capacity. Shortly after the boat left the Arnhem, it was described as sinking like a stone behind them and filling the sea with wreckage and men shouting in the water. The boat was unfortunately 
already dangerously overfilled, and so they were not able to return for anyone else. Soon after the Arnhem sank, the barge returned and came alongside the boat, having realized that, in their rush to abandon the ship, they had not considered the need for someone with a knowledge of navigation. The people in the boat agreed to send over Captain Van Osterhout, as well as about ten other people to lighten the load on the boat, but when they attempted the transfer, it destabilized the boat and caused panic. Frightened away by the shouts from the boat that they were going to sink, the barge rowed away again without taking on board anyone else. No one ever saw them again, and it is supposed that they were lost at sea without a navigator. Now left on their own, the men in the boat took stock of the situation. They had very little food and no water, and they were in the middle of the ocean in still stormy seas with a boat so overloaded that it would be of no surprise if it sank at any moment. They did, however, have some canvas and wood, and all of the navigational tools and charts they would need. Captain van Osterhout decided to head for Mauritius, which was about 160 miles away, and ordered sails to be fashioned rather than attempting to row the entire distance. Fortunately, as they started their voyage on the morning of the 13th of February, the storm had finally blown out and they were able to make good time with their makeshift sailing vessel. Things quickly deteriorated on the boat. The officers decided between them that the boat was too crowded, and the officers proposed to the captain that the ship should be lightened by at least 40 or 50 people. Captain van Osterhout quickly agreed to the proposal, and over the course of the second and third days they were in the boat, Thirteen people were seemingly randomly selected by the officers and thrown overboard. Among their number was the quartermaster, as well as the ship's chief surgeon. This likely would have continued, but the crew eventually became concerned that if the officers had their way, they would be the only people left on the ship, and proposed that things should be decided with the drawing of lots instead, with no one exempt. Just as the officers had decided themselves that people should be thrown overboard, now the crew voted and decided that if people were to be thrown overboard, it would be done with the luck of the draw, and officers should bear the risk as well. That they now also were on the chopping block alarmed the officers to such an extent that the entire topic was dropped. The boat would eventually be lightened by eight more people, Men who had not been able to bear the incredible thirst, hunger, and exposure of their situation. The incredible thirst was the most dire part of their situation, and it was therefore to the relief of everyone when some rain fell on the 19th and they were able to quench their thirst, though only a little. Of much greater relief was Mauritius, coming into view on the 20th, with its accompanying prospect of fresh water and wildlife they could hunt. The people in the boat got a taste for it before they even landed, when they caught a bird, which the members of the crew shared among themselves. Meanwhile, the officers claimed three flying fish that had landed in the boat for themselves. The boat came ashore on the evening of the 20th at the location where a Dutch fortress had once stood. Fort Frederick Hedrick had been abandoned in 1658, and would offer the castaways no shelter, having been demolished. As the men landed, they saw a river nearby, and there was a great rush to drink as much as they could from it, with one of the survivors, Everitz, saying that it was the sweetest drink he had ever tasted. Still weak from nine days in the boat and having had very little to eat, the men spent the night huddled together on the shore with nothing to shelter them from the wind and rain that blew in that night. The matter of business the next day was to find food, which they did in the form of snails and some mustard leaves, which were divided among everyone. Everything had been eaten raw, since they had no means to make a fire. That night, a fresh storm hit them with a violent fury that Everett's had no doubt that if they were still in the boat when it hit, they would have been destroyed. 
The storm drove the sea so high up onto the beach that they were forced to retreat further on shore, and the cold rain that poured down on them made everyone miserable. The storm had passed over them by the next day, but the first matter of business they had the next morning was to find shelter, which they did in the form of a cave. With this, they then began the hunt for food again. Fishing was soon found to be one of the best means to procure food, but there were also palm trees, oysters, and turtles. With food no longer in doubt, Captain van Osterhout and the bosun decided to put some provisions on the boat and see if they could get to Madagascar and then further to India. Thirteen members of the crew, mostly officers, joined him and they departed from Mauritius, leaving everyone else behind. Captain van Osterhout told the men he was leaving behind not to complain because he would tell the Dutch government in Ceylon about the disaster, so they would be saved. For the most part, the crew was sick of the captain and officers at this point and celebrated their departure. Soon after Captain Osterhout had left, a man who had brought a pistol from the Arnhem managed to use the flint of it to catch some moss on fire. The castaways quickly fed the fire until it became very large, and then divided it out of concern that if they only had one fire, it would go out and they would have to eat everything raw again. Without the captain and officers on the island, the castaways quickly broke up into groups of friends with no central camp. Everett and his friends trapped a large amount of fish in a large tidal pond and used this as their food stock for a time, starting the project of smoking and salting them so they would last longer. Everett had fortunately learned salt-making techniques in Indonesia from watching people working on the island of Ambon. Unfortunately, a rain came and caused this endeavor to fail because the fish all rotted and the smell of the rotting fish drove them to find a new home. The next place they tried to build a shelter had, in Everett's words, neighbors they did not like, and so they abandoned the main island entirely. Taking advantage of a low tide, they walked to a smaller island, most likely Isle d'Ambre, where they built a small hut away from everyone else. It was here that Everett and his friends found large, flightless birds that were easy to catch due to not being familiar with people as well as goats that had been left by the fort and sea turtles. Everett had heard the birds described before, though he referred to them as very big geese. He also called them by their well-known name of Dodo. This would prove to be one of the last, if not the last, accounts of a Dodo being seen. Whether or not Everett and his friends wiped out the population on their island home is not made clear in his account. Everett was not able to say how long they lived on this island, but they thrived. Drinking coconut milk, making liquor out of palm sap, eating and preserving as much food as they could eat for some time, and generally enjoying themselves. He calculated that it was several weeks before they decided to wander back onto the mainland and see how everyone else was doing. What he found was that his group was one of the few that was thriving, while many of the people on the rest of the island had become gaunt and were clearly struggling to find enough to eat. Everett and his friends seemed to have only then taken it upon themselves to teach the others about food preservation, including how to make salt. Another group, of whom a man named Stokram, also proved to be very good at hunting, and also taught these skills to other groups. Soon. Almost everyone was living in relative comfort on Mauritius. Interestingly, the accounts of the other survivors, who talk a lot about hunting, do not say anything about dodos, so they do not seem to have been on the main island. Everett and his group, meanwhile, do not clarify if they ate all of the dodos they found on the island they lived on, though, having lived there for several months, it seems very possible. In May of 1662, the group that Everett belonged to, and the group Stokram belonged to, had gotten together on the mainland to have a bit of a party when they saw a sail heading in their direction. 
Assuming that the ship intended to stop on Mauritius, they followed the ship by walking along the beach for three days until they saw the ship come to anchor and managed to attract its attention. The ship turned out to be the British ship, the Truro, but this did not mean that they were all saved. The captain of the Truro did not agree to take everyone from the island due to concerns about a lack of supplies on his ship. He agreed to take 20 people in total and to take a letter to the Dutch East India Company. Among the people who volunteered to stay behind was Stokram, who was provided with a large amount of supplies from the Truro before it left. The survivors on the island were so scattered that many of them did not even know a ship had come and gone. A second English ship stopped by the island two weeks later and offered to take everyone with him to India, but since everyone on the island wanted to return to the Netherlands at this point, this offer was refused. He also agreed to take a letter for the Dutch East India Company with him, and he left behind even more supplies for them. With this, Sokram decided it was time to gather all of the survivors together into one camp, the better to ensure everyone was well fed, and they would all be saved if another ship came. He was able to find all but ten of the men who were left on the island, and they formed a village in the bay where a ship was most likely to come. In October 1662, the French privateer ship named Le Angle Noir, under the command of a Dutch captain named Captain Hugo, came into the bay. In exchange for helping him provision his ship, Captain Hugo said that he would take the castaways to the island of St. Helena, where they could easily get passage to the Netherlands. Thirty-three men agreed to this, but the remaining men in the village refused, saying that they would not get on board a ship they considered to be piratical. Six of these men were rescued by a Dutch East India Company ship. The remaining people who landed on Mauritius from the Arnhem are not documented again, and their fate is unknown. Up through 1663, Dutch ships still occasionally stopped at Mauritius in the hope of finding further survivors. As for the group that left Mauritius with Captain Van Osterwout, they had an unfortunate voyage. They reached Madagascar, but two of the officers were killed in a fight with local warriors and Captain Van Osterhout passed away after becoming ill. The remaining ten people set sail for Ceylon, but another man would not survive this voyage. Nine people arrived in Gale and reported to the governor what had occurred. Multiple accounts would be written about the wreck of the Arnhem for the men who had survived it, including one by Van Halle, the ship's bookkeeper. The other three accounts were harsh in their descriptions of the officers, and agreed about all of the details, but Van Halle's account does everything it can to show the officers in a good light, and leaves out many of the details that the other writers speak of, which could be considered showing the management of the Arnhem in a bad light. In the face of the other three accounts, his words ring hollow, and the dysfunctional relationship between the crew and the officers is all too apparent. Only three ships from the 1662 return fleet of the Dutch East India Company would ever reach the Netherlands. The crew of the Arnhem was lucky, though it is doubtful that they felt they had been. Of the fleet that the Arnhem had departed Tavio as a part of, the Wappen van Holland, Prins Willem, and the Gechrunde Lu all sank without a trace in the same storm. It can never be known if the crews of those ships also took to the boats only to be lost in the storm, or if they never had a chance. For more information, please see Disaster in the Indian Ocean, The Lost Company Fleet of 1662 by Alphonse van der Kran, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.